I remember my friends really well. When I dug out this photo, I suddenly remembered lots of names, lots of friendships. These are really formative years. One of the students, one of my classmates, she always had her head stuck in a book. She was always reading. And she spoke quite sophisticated language to us for primary school. Her name was Zadie Smith. We had fantastic teachers. I remember some of my great teachers. One had a really great name, Mr. Rainbow. He used to take us out on school trips in London, and we used to go and explore really exciting spaces, cultural spaces, and listen to music. With his choir, we went on to go and win loads of fantastic awards, and he just really nurtured my learning. I also remember what was number one at the time in the music charts. It was the final countdown, and ironically, it was by a band named Europe. The final countdown, Europe. But what I remember most is that our classrooms had really large, big windows, and they let in abundancy of light. I used to go into those classrooms and make a beeline for those windows. So on reflection in my primary school years, I really enjoyed it, I had a great time. But I also, and recently, have been reflecting that I wasn't particularly academic. Numeracy, literacy, these things didn't really stick very well. And my teachers actually asked my parents to go and get my hearing tested to make sure I was hearing properly, hearing instruction. But it was fine. I had a, a bit of additional support, a bit of learning support, but uh, nothing was really ever diagnosed. And I often got moved away from those big windows and put to the other side of the classroom. What no one diagnosed back in my primary school was that I was a prolific mind wanderer. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'd like to argue today that we should be taking this much, much more seriously. I remember my creative output was enormous, abundant. I was always involved in being creative being active in that area. I also spent a lot of time not really sticking to the curriculum. I used to jump around the curriculum and work in a very interdisciplinary way. And I spent a lot of time gazing and exploring out of those windows. So now, today, I would like to argue it wasn't on the curriculum in the 80s, but it should be on the curriculum in our society today. After all, universal gravitation was discovered by Newton, not when he was engaged in intense activity, but when he was taking time out in the apple orchard, relaxing and allowing his mind to wander. Charlotte Bronte and her sisters created this fantastic world on the Yorkshire Moors, Gondor and Angria. And they wrote hundreds of small matchbook-sized stories about these fantastical worlds. And those stories seeded the incredible novels that were to follow. Harry came to J.K. Rowling, not necessarily when she was thinking about it, but when she was stuck on a train, a delayed train, between Manchester and London King's Cross. And Einstein's theory of relativity didn't come to him when he was deeply engaged in mathematical exercise, but when he was taking time out to explore his imagination and relax. So I believe mind-wandering is crucial. If only headlines had been around like this when I was a child. I, I, deep down, I knew I was a genius, really. <clears throat> but in all seriousness, I think we should be taking it a bit more seriously in today's society. Last year, the World Bank dedicated its development reports to one single issue for the first time in its history, education. In this report, they looked at the top skills that would be needed by future generations, the most essential skills by 2020. 2020, not long away. I'd like to focus on one of these in particular. And I'd like to look at it across a number of areas. First of all, I'd like to look at it in the context of creativity and our imagination. As we enter into a world where we see something called the fourth industrial revolution coming upon us, our ability as humans to be imaginative and to apply that imagination through creativity is what really makes us distinctive. I believe that imagination is a future survival skill. I think we'll need it in the future to 
survive. It allows us to be resilient. It allows us to be responsive to the rapid change that's happening. Secondly, creativity and skills. Creativity is a great skill. You can cut it across everything. You can add creativity to mathematics, to engineering. But as a skill in itself, it is hugely important to this country and many other countries around the world. And in, as an industry, it is already worth 90 billion pounds. There are 2 million people who are employed in the creative sectors in this country, and it's outstripping the growth of the UK economy by two to one. And as we come to the end of the month, where we've been celebrating fashion and showcasing all the amazing achievements of fashion, we now know that there are nearly as many jobs in this country in the fashion sector as there are in the financial services. Finally, I'd like to look at creativity in the context of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, this thing that's looming, which we don't really know a huge amount about, but we know is becoming quite important in our lives. Perhaps the one thing that will define us and make us different from the machines and the robots will be our ability to be creative. I don't know for sure whether they will be able to daydream and mind wonder, but I think creativity makes us very distinctive from any other species on this planet. And I'm hopeful that it will make us different from those robots and those machines who perhaps one day might threaten to take our jobs. So why am I talking about creativity in the context of mind wandering? Well, the good news is, and with the rapid advancement of neuroscience, there seems to be some very clear links to creativity and mind wandering. Now, I'm no neuroscientist, as I said, so I'm going to try and start by just talking about it like a layperson. And often when I try and explain something, I just sketch it out and doodle it. So here goes. So that's me up there. I'm not wearing a wear, uh, sunglasses. Those, that's my brain. It's a colorway of my brain. And let's say that I am going to engage in something that is not too taxing, a task or an activity that's not too taxing. So we have three children in our household. There's always tons of washing up. So I'll get engaged in washing up. It's a task that I do regularly. I know how it works. It doesn't really involve much brain power from my perspective. So I will start doing the washing up, and it allows me and my mind to wonder. Off those thoughts go. Sometimes this happens, and I end up on a beach, and it's really hot and sunny, and it's lovely. But most of the time, this happens. It becomes a space for me to have ideas. Sorry, this happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's a space for ideas. So let's get a little bit more scientific about it. Um, and here I'm going to draw inspiration from an organization called the London Brain Project. If you haven't heard of them, they're fantastic. A group of neuroscientists and artists who bring this amazing organ in our head to life. And uh, they've done quite a bit of research in this area. Um, and they start to talk about mind wandering being this experience that we have. We sort of detach from our everyday surroundings. We kind of go into this space where we're having a, an introspective thought. And that introspective thought is controlled uh, by an area called the default mode network. Now, areas of that default mode network can start engaging with our executive controls. So we can have these quite wondrous, mind wondrous thoughts. And we can start to take a bit of control of them. We can start to actually bring them forward. Not all of them, but some of them. That's pretty cool, I think. That's like. That's a bit of a superpower. We can go off and drift off and have these amazing ideas, but then we can bring them into reality, into our world, and actually take them forward as an exciting potential idea. And not only that, we also get to time travel, too. So we get to revisit the past, and we get to look ahead to the future as well. We get to use our imagination. So uh, our, our brains are pretty amazing things. So continuing along this theme of linking creativity to my wondering, there is now also evidence out there that suggests this is actually true. There's a really clear link. And in this research paper, the research looked at something called an unusual use task. So essentially, the participants would take, a, take a, an object, and they'd be asked how many ways they could think about using it in an unusual way. 
and the participants were split into two groups, and some were given quite demanding tasks before they took this test, and some were given not particularly taxing tasks before this test. And unsurprisingly, those who did the untaxing task performed much higher scores in this unusual use test. Some even said that in sitting around and doing these un unexciting tasks, not particularly interesting things before they took the test, that their minds started to wonder. So this all sounds great. There's scientific evidence out there, there's reports, and it feels like it's, it could be something quite tangible, quite genuine. But I wanted to put it into my context and think, OK, what does this mean for me? So um, I was thinking back to times when I've had ideas. Um, so my wife has just turned 40. Uh, a couple of years ago, I turned 40. And she did some fantastic stuff for me. It was very creative. I felt really grateful. Uh, we had a fantastic birthday. So the pressure was on. I had to make her 40th even better. And I was finding it hard to actually just get the time and the space to be thinking about it. Busy lives, work, children. So I was beginning to get a bit panicky about it. And it was about three weeks before her birthday, and I still hadn't come up with that great idea until I got stuck in a traffic jam. And in that traffic jam, I had the contextual thoughts of what was going on in my wife's world. So she's passionate about English. She studied it. She teaches it. And she's passionate about poetry. So those are the contextual thoughts going on in my mind as I'm sitting in this traffic jam. Nothing's happening. My mind's wandering. And it came to me in that moment that what would happen, what could happen, is I could actually create her own poetry book, written, produced, by the ones she loves the most, her friends and her family. And so Poems for Amy was born. Literally in that traffic jam, I was texting everyone going, you've got three weeks, you've got to be really creative, you've got to write this poem. But it came together, and we published it just in time. And it was a fantastic book, and I'm hugely grateful to all friends and family. Another example was when I was walking in this park in London, and I was walking along and taking in the beautiful trees, and I'm looking up, and my mind started to wander. And I started putting into context all the great things about parks. It's great to be outdoors. You really enjoy yourself. You get to be physically active. It's, it's better and healthier for you. But in that moment, I thought, well, what, what about the people who don't get the access to these parks? What about the people who don't live in the neighborhood of parks and get all the advantages that come with parks? And I thought, what, what would happen if actually you could pop up a park? You could take the best bits and elements of that park and bring them to the doorsteps of those who need them the most, particularly children and young families living in densely populated urban environments. And so Pop-Up Parks was born. At the time, the Design Council and Guys in St. Thomas's Charity were running an incubator program to allow people to put forward innovative ideas to help with health and well-being. So with their seed funding and in their incubator, we devised this program with people. Uh, we even got a bit of money to buy uh, an ambulance, an old ambulance, and convert it into this pop-up park mobile that could literally rock up into a space and really bring elements of what you gain in the park to the people who needed it in very densely populated areas. So in my work today, I am dedicating my career to trying to create the right environment to allow people to use their creativity and to allow people to apply their imagination. At the Institute of Imagination, we're creating a world-class destination for London where people are invited to take every hat off and just come in and be free and playful in that space. We've created something called Imagination Lab. It's the beginnings of what will be something more permanent in the center of London. An Imagination Lab Children, families, all generations are invited to come in and work in a space, an environment that really encourages people to explore their imagination. There are no predetermined outcomes in the lab. It's an experimental space in its name. And they're invited to make a mess. They're, they're invited to actually just use materials and explore their creativity and imagination. So the future, I think, is bright. And I think the future is mind-wandering. And in the spirit of Einstein, I've created this little mini formula myself. And it basically goes that we as humans are very creative, and we're living in very disruptive times. 
things are happening quite quickly and change is happening quite quickly. So if you add those two things together, what you need, what the formula is, is more possibilities to mind wonder. And I've squared it off as well, because I know mathematicians and physicians always do that. And I never quite understood it. But anyway, I thought that would probably be a good thing. In my work today, I'm extremely lucky. So I still have those great big windows to look out of. And I want to encourage all of us to give the opportunity, particularly to children and young people, to mind wander, to gaze, and to have those spaces to do that. I believe the future of our race, of humanity, is, is reliant on it. Thank you.